Okay, so we're going to get started with exercise 204. Uh, today we're switching from Rhino into V-Ray. We're going to spend the day working in V-Ray and kind of getting our feet wet with V-Ray. Then we'll go back to Rhino next class and we'll build some more and then we'll come back to V-Ray. So it'll be a back and forth. Um, and I think it works well that way because as you learn to model in Rhino, you're also thinking about the materials. And V-Ray is a pretty daunting piece of the puzzle and it takes a while to get used to it. So the earlier we start, uh, the better. I've been trying, like, like I said in the beginning of the semester, we just this semester upgraded from the old version of V-Ray to the new version of V-Ray. And while the options are essentially the same, sorry, they totally reorganized everything. So um, as we go through and you guys look at old tutorials and whatever, I'm trying and I've worked through and, and rewritten a bunch of them already. Um, to have the new version and then followed by the old version <laughs> of where things are because they're completely different. Um, so we're going to go through the new version today. I'm trying on these tutorials to have them done before I start talking about it, but there will be cases where I won't get to it or, or whatever uh, and they won't be updated. So I'll do my best, but that's what happens when you guys get the first round of something new. So the good news is you get the first round of something new. So it kind of works out. So we're going to start today in exercise 204 by setting up a very basic scene that we can then render. And so what I'm asking for is a simple composition of five objects. Doesn't matter what the objects are, uh, I'm going to go ahead and create those objects right now. I'm going to use the solid uh, objects that are available here. I'll start with a box. Uh, and so we will create a box. And the scale itself doesn't really matter. Oh, this reminds me, if you're, if you've, Freshly opened up Rhino. Remember, we have to uncheck that OpenGL option. So I'll go to Tools and then Options. And at the very bottom under View, I'm going to go to the OpenGL and turn off that GPU tessellation. There we go. And now I can see my objects. Hopefully, they'll fix it by the end of the semester. But that's going to be something that we're going to continue having to fix. So I have my first object here. I'm going to switch over into solid mode. I'll hit the uh, down triangle in perspective view and we'll switch over into shaded view for right now. Then we'll go ahead and create a few more um, shapes. I'll go to the next one over which is a cylinder. We'll build a little bit of a cylinder here. Maybe like that. We'll come over to the next one. Uh, sure, why not? Let's do a sphere behind over here. Make that a little bit bigger. Right now it's only half because it's going down below. So I'm going to take this and this is a great opportunity to use one of these side views and I'm going to move that up. I can do that by just dragging it or I could actually type move and then click from and you know from one point to another point. It, the precision of this really doesn't matter because we're going to experiment with materials a little bit later on. So let's see here. Let's do, sure why not, let's do a cone next to it. So we'll do a little cone right here like that. and. I'm going to do kind of like a wall behind all of these objects. So I'm going to do something like that. We'll pull that up a little bit taller. Maybe like that. And we'll move this just back a little bit. And yeah, maybe right about there. So essentially, I just created some objects and we're going to start assigning some materials. What your objects look like today doesn't matter. Today's about the materials and we're going to play around with that. So however you create these, these objects is just fine. So I've done, uh, on part one, I've done step one. The next one, um, I'm going to skip, well, no, well, no, I'll skip step two for a second. We'll get a couple other things and then I'll come back to step two. I think it makes more sense to stick in V-Ray once we get there. Um, I'm going to follow V-Ray 8.5, which is to create a V-Ray infinite plane. This is about as simple as it possibly can get. Uh, the only thing that you need to know is what the symbol looks like for V-Ray infinite plane, which has changed. If we look at our V-Ray toolbar right here, uh, there's a tool that kind of looks like a square with a little infinity sign in it. If you click on that, it will create the V-Ray infinite plane. That's all there is to it. It's very simple. Uh, essentially what that does is it creates a ground for us that goes off to wherever the horizon is. And so that gives us some ground to work from. So I've got that established. That's good. Um, and so that's V-Ray infinite plane. I need a basic directional light. So the directional light, there is a tutorial for this. It's Rhino 5.17. I find that it's easiest to create a box first. 
So I'll use this box tool to create a box, maybe about like that. And then I'll use opposite corners of that box to help me with this uh, directional light. So to pick the directional light, I'm going to come again up to the V-Ray toolbar. I'll go to the last of the light options, which are kind of the brownish colored options. It's a directional light. I'll click on it, and it's going to ask me for the end of the light direction vector. I'll choose the end of the light direction vector as this corner. I'm going to use my snap, so let me turn on end, mid, and perpendicular. And I'll snap to that end right there. And then start of light direction vector, I'll snap to the opposite corner right up there. You could try to create this yourself, but what happens is you end up always creating a flat light. You see how that light never comes up? When you use the box, you can always get an angle so that the light's coming down after the fact. So it's, it's a nice way of kind of establishing the light. And then when you're done, you can go ahead and delete the box, and now you have your light. Uh, set up for you. So it's a little bit easier. This light direction vector, it makes no difference how far away it is from your object. It, all it is is uniform light coming in one direction. That's it. So it's just a symbol for that. So we have kind of universal light going in that direction uh, coming down on our objects. Okay, so now uh, one more thing I'll do and that is that I'll, I'll get my view such that I like it. Let's say that this is the view that I like right there, maybe a little bit yeah, right about there. I like that. I'm going to go ahead and save this view and we'll get in the habit of doing it. Whenever you're going to do renderings, it's nice to have a saved view so you come back and do exactly the same rendering and you can see what, what changes. I'm going to do that by clicking the downward arrow again where it says perspective. I'll click that down arrow and I'll go to um, set view named views. So once again, it's that down arrow, set view, named views. And that brings up the named views dialog box where I can click the save as button and then give this a name. We'll call this render one. And I'll go ahead and say OK. The advantage here is that if I move my view, I can come back here and under set view, I can go back to render one and it will always be that same view over and over again. And so when we're doing renderings, it's really useful because you'll, you'll tweak some settings, you might move around a little bit, then you want to come back and do the, the exact same render. It doesn't matter so much for this because all the renderings would be close enough, but let's say you're establishing a view to do your final rendering for your final project and you've got the view set up perfect, it's exactly right with the camera at the right angle and everything, you don't want to have to go back and find that over and over again. You save it and then you can always come back and do that rendering. So now I'm going to move myself back up to step two, and that's where I'm going to actually open up V-Ray for the first time. So in the old version of V-Ray, we had different, we had an uh, V-Ray options that would open, and then we had materials that would open. Yeah. You'd have uh, options that would open and materials that would open, and there were different subcategories of V-Ray. In this version of V-Ray, V-Ray 3.6, when we open V-Ray itself, it's always going to open something called the Asset Editor. And so I'm going to click on the V-Ray button, which is the first button on either V-Ray toolbar. And when I click on that, it's going to open up this thing called the V-Ray Asset Editor. And this V-Ray Asset Editor is what allows us access to pretty much everything related to V-Ray. So they've consolidated everything into one uh, particular piece here. So as we start to explore this, I want to show you a few things. So the first button here is for materials. And so that opens up our materials. The next one over are V-Ray objects. And it could be the uh, directional, oh, excuse me, these are lights. We've got a Rhino Document Sun. We've got a V-Ray directional light. The next one over is V-Ray objects. So in this case, the only V-Ray object we have is an infinite plane. The rest of them are Rhino objects. Then we have our settings, which we'll come back to in a second. We have our rendering options. And we have what's called the render frame buffer which opens up the window that we're doing the rendering in in the first place. So I'm going to stick on the materials, which is the gear looking icon here. And we're going to take a look at what some of the options mean and how do we explore those options. This, of course, is written up. And if I go to this first one here under global switches, it will help you go through the various global switches. I'm going to talk through these options, but it's all here. So if, if you get a little bit lost, just go back and look at what I have set up here. Uh, and that will explain everything for you as well. So 
Uh, let me come back over here into my V-Ray Asset Editor. Okay, V-Ray likes to compress things into smaller little drawers, and so there's always something to open. Um, so they try to make it look simple when it's really not simple. And that's just the way that V-Ray sets this stuff up. So under Renderer here, we have our rendering engine is currently set to the CPU. On these computers, we don't have particularly fantastic graphics cards, so switching to the GPU isn't going to help much. So sticking with the CPU is a good idea. Below that, we have something called interactive. Again, if we had much faster computers, this would be something that might be useful. It might be helpful if you were really trying to tweak some settings. You wanted to see a full render preview frequently. Uh, you could turn that interactive render on. Basically, it takes the current viewport and makes that an active render. So it's always rendering. So you move, the, you move something, you change something, it's always updating and showing you the true rendered view. It's pretty heavy on the computer. It takes a lot of rendering power to do that. It takes a lot of computer power to do it. So I don't recommend turning it on right away. So we'll leave that off for right now. Um, we'll leave progressive set to on. Under quality here, we'll leave it as medium. We will bump this up when we start to do final renderings. But the medium quality is enough for what we're trying to do, uh, certainly today. So below that, we have something called camera. And this is where we can change some settings relating to the camera. We're not going to worry about this just yet, so I'm going to go ahead and collapse that. Below that is called render output. This is the size and aspect ratio that we are um, rendering. We have some various options here. It's set to a 16 by 9, by, which is essentially a widescreen if we wanted to do the rendering. We could set some of the other typical um, uh, frame sizes. We can also choose to match viewport, which sometimes people really like because what you see in your viewport is exactly what you get coming out of the rendering. Um, any of those options are fine for our purposes today. Right here under image width and height, we can actually go in and edit the size of the final rendering. We're doing it at 800 by 450. That's totally fine. Uh, I think in the handout, I might say 640 by 480. It really doesn't matter. So we'll leave it as that. I just like to point that out to you. Below that, render output, we have something called environment. This is what is happening in, uh, behind our objects for right now. Eventually, we'll get creative. We'll put clouds. We'll put skies in and, and whatever. For our purposes right now, we'd prefer not to have a black background. So I'm going to actually change that black background. So right here, if I click on the black color, it will bring up a V-Ray color picker. And I can then change the settings here. Uh, they have two different ways of typing in values, should you want to type in values. We have a, a 0 to 1 value, or if you're used to 0 to 255 value, you could do it that way. I'm going to switch to 0 to 255. Uh, and I have a kind of a light blue color, and I don't remember the settings off the top of my head what they were. Um, 250, 252, and 255. So I'll say 250. 252 and 255. It, it's, a, it's an approximate value. It's close, very, very close to white. When I'm done putting those values in, I'll go ahead and close this V-Ray color picker, and that then sets my background to be white. And that'll help for our rendering purposes. We'll get to some of the other options. Below that, we also have a drawer for environment overrides that include skylight and reflection and reflection backgrounds. We'll get to all this stuff a little bit later in the semester. Material override, which is this next option, essentially says take away all the materials in a scene and just render them with a basic material. This can be useful if you're trying to uh, figure out some problematic, what's causing my render to crash, why is one material not showing. You could say just temporarily override everything with a different material and see if it renders. Um, it's not something that I, we will turn on right now, and it's not something you'll use very often, but it's there. The last thing down here is called the V-Ray Swarm. This is the network rendering capability of V-Ray. For our purposes today, we don't need to turn it on and use it, but we will lose, use it a little bit later on in the semester. It allows you to use resources from other computers in the lab that aren't being used to their full extent. So it helps our renderings speed up a little bit faster. So that was the basic set of options available to us. The problem with V-Ray is there's always more options, and they like to hide them. So if you look right here on the right side of this window, there's a little arrow. If I click on that little arrow, it pulls out another drawer of more options. Uh, and this is classic V-Ray. So we're going to go through some of these options now. 
So they're only accessible via that little arrow that, that pops us out to the side. So first thing here under uh, ray trace, we're going to leave those options as a default. Our global illumination, this is basically just general lighting in the scene. It's reflected light. It should be left on. Um, the, um, in your handout on step two, I really should have crossed off the unchecked show GI only box. That's not available anymore. That was in the old version of E-Ray, so I apologize for that. I didn't catch it before I did it. Um, this is how V-Ray is going to be doing its rendering. It's going to be using brute force and light cache as its systems of doing the rendering. All of those options are just fine. As we come down here, caustics is the next thing. Caustics are really important if we're doing um, renderings of like water or glass. We're not doing those renderings today, so we're going to leave those turned off. They increase the complexity of the rendering to have those turned on, but they'll be more accurate renderings afterward. Uh, we're going to skip on volumetric environment um, and the rest of our render elements and switches we're going to leave off, I think. These switches here are some of the global switches. Um, we want to make sure that our lights are turned on, which they are by default. Our hidden lights are left off, so if we had a light on a layer and we didn't want it to render, we could turn the layer off and that would cause it not to render. Uh, and our shadows are turned on. So all of those are set by default, but since we're going through options, it's worth talking about them anyway. So those are our essential basic options that we've gone through. You notice that I really didn't change much. The default options are pretty much fine. I'd just like to talk you through what it is and where it is to get started. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to start to work with the materials themselves. And so we've moved on into part two, and we're going to assign some basic materials to our objects. So I'm going to go ahead and close this drawer to the right for now. And I'm going to switch over into the Materials tab of the V-Ray Asset Editor. So I'll click on the Materials tab here. And so this is our most basic V-Ray materials. Currently, under our Materials list, we have no materials because we have nothing in our scene. I can create a brand new material by coming down here to the bottom and clicking on the button to add a material. So if I click on that button, it's going to give me a pop-up that lets me choose what kind of material I want to create. We're just going to create a generic material today. So I'll click on generic, and as soon as I do that, we get a preview of my generic material showing up here. It's just gray. If I want to assign that generic material to an object, I can do two things. One, I can click on the object, and then I can come back to where it says generic, and I can right click on it and say apply material to selection. That will then take this generic material and apply it to that object. The other option is if I had these objects on different layers, I could right to click on my material and say apply to layer, and then the layer would be listed here. And I could pick from one of those layers. In this case, all the objects are on one layer, so it doesn't really help for me to assign it by layer. Long term, you're going to be assigning materials by layer most likely all the time. Because it's much simpler. You have lots of objects. All those objects need to have a particular material on it. It's easy to apply it to a layer rather than selecting all of the individual objects. So what if we want our material to have different properties? We don't want it to be just gray. Well, I have some options here. First thing I can do is I can take my generic material and I can rename it. So I'll right click on it and I'll say rename. And I'm going to call this generic-red to get started. So I've renamed it. Then I'm going to look at the drawer to the right. So I'm going to click that little arrow on the right side and expand that. Now I have options related to this particular material. So it's selected. And we look here under our um, options. And we're going to look under the diffuse little drop down. So there's diffuse. Diffuse basically means what's the solid color of an object. And so right now that diffuse color is set to gray. If I want to change that color, I'm going to click on the box for gray, and I'm going to change it to say something like red. Notice that as soon as I change the color, my preview updates, and I get the material as being red rather than being um, gray. So now that's done. I have a basic material as red. That material has been assigned to this particular object. I could go ahead and do a test render and see what this looked like. I'll make sure that the Render 1 viewport here is selected. And then I'll go ahead and click on the Render button, which is the little teapot. 
and it will bring up my frame buffer and start my rendering. So as it works through the rendering process here, we can see that yes, this cylinder has that red material applied to it, which is a good thing. I'm not going to watch this finish, so I'll go ahead and I'll click on the stop for right now, and I'll close that V-Ray frame buffer. And we're going to go back to where we saw the asset editor, and I'm going to create several more materials. I'm actually going to create five total materials. I'll go ahead and right click, or excuse me, I'll click on the add material button at the bottom here. Add another generic material. This one I will rename, so I'll right click and say rename. This will be generic uh, green. You can pick any colors you want. I'm just picking colors. We'll add another generic material, and this one will be generic. How about blue? We'll add another material. How about orange? And we'll add another one. How about pink? OK, so I've gone through and I've created these. Oops, I missed the space here. I've created these materials, but of course they're all still uh, they're basic. They're still basic gray. So I need to change their diffuse color. So I'll start with this first one that is orange. I'll click on the, the diffuse color right here. And we'll change it to an orange, something like that. There we go. I'll move down to my blue. I'll click on the color, and we'll change to blue. There's the blue. I'll click on green here, and we'll change the color to be a green. I'll click on my pink. And we will change the color to be a pink. My daughter would be so happy with that color. And I have my red. Next thing I need to do is I need to make sure that I assign all of these materials to each of the objects in my scene. So this one was already red. Let's take the square here, and I'll apply the pink. So I'm going to click on pink. I'll right click and say Apply Material to Selection. I'll go back to my cone, select my cone. I'll right click on green and say apply material to selection. I will click on the sphere here. I will right click on blue and say apply material to selection. I will click on the wall at the back here. I will right click on orange and say apply material to selection. Now in this scenario, it's kind of difficult because all the objects are showing up as gray in my view. And I don't know for sure that the materials are applied or maybe I can't remember what they're uh, applied on. I can switch my view. I'll, if I click this little downward facing triangle here, I can switch my view into something called rendered. And when I do that, this is a rhino approximation of what our rendered view should look like. Generally, it's reasonable. Sometimes the lighting is awful and it's all black, in which case it's not very useful. I should also point out that it is distinctly different from the V-Ray interactive rendering which will actually render the viewport on a consistent basis. For our purposes, that's too CPU intensive for what we're trying to do for right now. So we're going to leave that off. So if we see it in rendered form, sometimes that helps you to see it a little bit better, like that. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and perform a real rendering and take a, take a look at it. So I'll click on the little teapot here, and we'll go ahead and render this out. So it builds up the light cache first. And then we'll wait for this to, to process its way through. And that's one of the, the challenging things when we're in this class. There's always going to be these little lags. And that's because I have to let V-Ray finish its doing its rendering. Sometimes toward the end of the semester, the renderings will be complicated enough where I'll start the rendering, tell you guys to start working, and then we'll come back and look at it 10 minutes later because it takes time to do the rendering. Uh, there's no real way around it uh, as much as I would like to. So this is my first view that has my materials assigned to it. So I was successful. They were able to be applied to it. We're seeing some shadows being cast. That's good. Those are from our light that we installed. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to save this first rendered view. I'm going to click on this little disk icon. And I will go to my flash drive into today's folder. And 
And let me create a folder for this semester. Uh, and we'll say render. And I'll go ahead and save that. So at this point, I've been able to assign all of the materials, and I've been able to assign a color to those particular materials. That's a good thing. The next thing that I may want to do is I may want to make one or more of these materials have some reflective property. Because right now, they're perfectly matte. They're not reflecting anything. So let me go to my pink material, for example. And the nice thing about the new V-Ray is we get live previews as we create this. As we change options, this immediately starts to um, be seen. So the next thing that I'm going to do with the pink selected, I'm going to go into Reflection. And I'm going to change the reflection color from black. I'm going to move it toward white. And so this slider controls how reflective our material is. So as I start to make this change, you can see that my material starts to become shiny. You see that happen? If I move all the way up to this direction, we see that it's very shiny. So just by dragging that slider from one side to the other, I can control how shiny this particular material is. If we look at the material, and this is where, since you're all doing it, you guys can see it carefully on your computer screens. It's not always as clear up here. But we also have the, ab hold on, the ability to change how sharp the reflection is. So we come down here under reflection glossiness. I can actually pull this value down, and you'll see that the reflection, it's still reflecting, but it's not as sharp. So I could come up here to maybe 0.75, and we see, yep, there's still a, a halo right there, but it's not sharp. And this would be depending on the material you're trying to create. You may want it to be real shiny. You may want it to be reflective, but not perfectly shiny. And if you look around at the stuff that's around you, many things are reflective, but their ability to reflect changes. And so this is how we start to get realistic materials. So I've done this for pink. Let me come over here to green. And let me adjust that reflection here. We'll bump that one up so it's shiny. And we'll leave this one as a nice, shiny material. And then maybe I'll adjust the red. to be just a little bit shiny or something like that. And pull, pull, pull that back just a little bit. So it's pretty easy to go through and make those changes as well. This is just with the reflection layer. I'm going to go ahead and do another render. So I'll click on the Render with V-Ray button. And it will build over the top. And now we'll be able to take a look at what it looks like with some reflection on some of these materials. Almost done. Perfect. So now that one's done. And if you look at this carefully, if you look at the green and you look at the pink, they're reflecting back and forth at each other. And so that's part of what makes this a more realistic rendering. And that's part of why V-Ray is so good. Uh, V-Ray will actually trace up to 16 bounces of light. So if you had light and it came down here and it hit this green, it would then reflect off and hit the pink. Then it would reflect off the pink and come back to the green. It would re you get the idea. So it'll keep tracing it. And that's part of what makes it very accurate. I'm going to go ahead and save this result. And I'll click Save. Now I'm noticing that I did these slightly out of order. It doesn't really matter for what we're doing. I did step 9 before step 8 on the handout. Such is life. So at this point, we're also going to play around with the transparency of a particular material. So let's go ahead and play with that pink material again. I'm going to close up some drawers. So the reflection drawer I'm going to close up. I'm going to come down to the opacity drawer. There it is. And this is going to allow me to adjust how transparent this particular material is. Again, we have a slider, or we could actually type in a value. 
So as I start to slide this back, we'll see that the material starts to become more transparent. Let's slide this back a little bit more. There you go. And so we're seeing that transparency of that material. So let's say that that's enough transparency for this particular material. Let me move on to the green. Notice that it also changed here in my view, even though that's not the best preview. I'm going to look at my opacity. And we'll make that one really transparent. And maybe we'll take this blue one and we'll make that one a little bit transparent too. So I've gone through and I've made those changes. Now we'll come back and we'll do another render. So I'll click on that little teapot and we'll let this render out. Notice that it got a lot slower, because now we're calculating light going through an object. So it's somewhat transparent, but it's also reflecting against that object. So we added a lot to the complexity of this rendering. So give it a little bit of time. So while it's waiting, I'm going to introduce another concept. And we'll come back to see that in a second. Um, let me turn on. I'm going to look at the uh, V-Ray 8.4, which is the material reflection layer. We already dealt with reflection, but we haven't dealt with refraction just yet. And so refraction happens when we have light passing through a material. And I think the easiest way of kind of explaining this is let's say that you had a glass of water sitting on a desk. And we needed to be able to render that glass of water. Well, when light hits the glass, it gets bent a little bit as it goes through the glass. Then it goes into the water and it gets bent even more. So if we were trying to do a realistic render, we need that refraction of light. It's not about the reflection, but it's also, so some of the light is being reflected back at us. The other part of the light is being bent inside the material itself. So V-Ray has the ability to calculate that as well. Uh, it's called the index of refraction, or IOR. And that IOR is going to vary based on a particular material, depending on what it is you're trying to render. So we can actually look up this IOR value. And I have a list here. I have a link to it. That's why I pulled up this tutorial right down here at the bottom that has a link of known IOR values for rendering. Uh, there's a disclaimer on here that says this is not scientific. This is about rendering and getting good results. But we can look down here and we can see a whole variety of materials that are available to us, like an emerald, for example, is going to have a variety of these IOR values, somewhere between 1.56 and 1.605. If we looked at a diamond, there's probably a diamond under D somewhere. There, a diamond. 2.418 is the index of refraction. So depending on the material you're trying to create, you would be putting that value in. So let's use that diamond material. And we'll, we'll convert my uh, pink into a diamond. So there's my diamond. I'm going to come back to Rhino and ultimately my V-Ray frame buffer here. Or excuse me, my, uh, oh, I meant to save that. Hold on. This was the last one that just finished. Let me save that as version 3. And now I'm going to come back to the pink. And so right here, we've, we've done reflection. I'm going to move down to refraction. And if we look here under IOR, it's set at 1.6. I'm going to change that value into that 2.418, which would be diamond. Once I've done that, we're going to see a change here. I probably also need to adjust my opacity just a little bit so it's even a little bit more transparent. Maybe right about like that. So I'm starting to work through my options. So that IOR is going to be specific to a given material. So if I was trying to create a diamond or water or something else, I would reference a list like that. Water's probably down here somewhere.
There's water. They even have ice. So we've got a variety depending on what it is you were trying to create. So you can look that stuff up and you can then put it into your material and that will change the quality of that rendering, uh, which is how the light passes through that particular object. Now having a giant cube shaped diamond is probably not the most realistic thing, but I like to point it out uh, that way. So I've gone ahead and I've adjusted that as well. So we've worked our way through, oh, I, I should point out one other thing about um, the reflection and the refraction. As soon as you add in refraction of light through passing through an object, obviously the intensity and the, the CPU power to render goes way up because we're calculating how much the light is bending as it goes through the object. If you're not overly concerned with perfectly accurate uh, bending of light, you can turn off refraction and override it with an, a reflection IOR that mimics it and it uses a little bit less CPU power. If you weren't trying to render you know, something through a glass of water or whatever, you might be able to get away with it and it saves a little bit on the CPU power. But I like to point out that you can, you can in fact override it. You see that it's turned off by default because it's using the refraction instead of the reflection IOR. So there are two different places that you can input that. Okay, so we've done the, uh, the reflection, we've done the refraction, we've done the transparency, we've done the IOR, and we did the reflection glossiness already. At this point, I'm going to do one more render. So let me click on that teapot again. We'll render this one up. We'll take a look at what it looks like. All right, well, I'll let that go in the background uh, for now, and then we'll come back to it, and I'll save that view. So we've created materials from scratch. The thing about it is it would be an awful lot of work if every time we wanted to do some kind of a rendering, we had to create a material completely from scratch. So V-Ray also gives us a bunch of materials that are preloaded in. Uh, and this is a nice change from the old version. From the old version, you had to download, I gave you a material library, and you could work with that. V-Ray now has quite a collection of materials built in. I'm going to open the drawer to the left this time, and we're going to see that these are all materials that have been created by uh, the Chaos Group, the makers of V-Ray. And so on any one of these, I could go into bricks, for example, and we can see different previews of bricks. If I liked something, let's say that I liked this simple bricks, I could drag it over into my materials list, and we could see a preview of what those bricks look like. If we wanted uh, you know, leather, we could pick leather. Let's see if I can find something a little bit better. They do have liquid. They have water. Uh, look, they even have red wine. So we've got a lot of options here uh, that are pre-made for us. There are stone options. So if you liked a stone wall, for example, you could drag that over and you could take a look at what that stone wall would look like. So these are all built in. You can use all of them. They work the same way that these materials work um, that we've, we've applied. So I could, t for example, take the orange wall. I could right click on stone and say apply material to selection. And now that stone would be applied to that uh, material. It may not look quite right because texture mapping hasn't been applied just yet. That's another lecture that we'll talk about later on. So if it looks kind of funny and you don't like it, pick some different material. I would encourage you to stay away from the liquids and the glass scenario because you're not really ready. You don't have enough scene for it to look that great. So pick other things. Um, I'll try leather, for example. Let's put the uh, black leather over here. And we'll apply material to selection. I'm not sure why it didn't quite change. Anyway, we'll, uh, we'll work through, here's paper, sure why not, we'll put, and let's apply that to, I don't know, this surface, apply to selection, anyway, you guys get the idea that we can apply any one of these materials. 
So I'm going to ask you guys, once this is done, I'll go ahead and save this one. This is now render four. We'll click save. Pick from the list of materials that are available in V-Ray. Find ones that you find interesting. Apply them to your objects. Um, there we go. So I've gone through, I've applied these. We'll go ahead and we will render this after I'm done. Whoops, let me pick something new for this surface here. Let's go into metal and see if there's anything good. All right, and then we'll go ahead and we'll render that one out and see what the end result would be. So I'm going to let that start its render. Let me open up the frame buffer so we can see it. There we go. So we can see that start to build out. Okay. We're going to ask that you do that to your objects. Pick some of the, the, the default options there, and then you'll save that one as well. When you're done with that, the last thing that you're going to do is you're going to open up the... Uh, so in part three, sorry, I'm just reading through to make sure that... I talk about downloading the material archive. There's enough materials in here to get you guys started. You don't have to worry about downloading uh, a brand new material archive. We'll get to that for those materials a little bit later on. Uh, but we've got enough built in so you don't have to do that. Uh, then open your 3D file from last class. Remember that house that you guys were working on? And apply a material to that. So it's going to be a new file. You're going to have to do an infinite plane underneath, a directional light, and then you'll go ahead and apply material to that wall of some kind, and you'll do another rendering. It's kind of a way of testing to make sure you can do it on your own. Does that kind of make sense? When you're all done, you're going to post all of these images that you've saved to the course website in one post. It would be nice if you used the gallery format for those of you that were in 135 before um, you guys did that, so it should be uh, really fairly easy. There's a walkthrough on the back. If you've never done it, don't worry. Just call me over after you have all your images saved, and I'll help you get through that as well. So here's my last option here. I'll go ahead and save that one with these materials on it. This is render 5. And then I'm not going to open that old file and, and assign a material because I want to test you guys and see if you're understanding what I'm talking about, about getting the options set right and, and that sort of thing. Okay? So does that kind of make sense? So this is real quick and dirty introduction to V-Ray and assigning materials. And you can see that you can actually get reasonable results using some of the default materials um, rendering. Some of the other materials like this back one where the texture isn't quite right or it's too big or whatever, we're going to talk through how to fix that uh, in an upcoming lecture. That'll actually be the next one that we talk through. So we'll spend a lot more time with V-Ray. This is by no means the, the, the beginning or the, the end of V-Ray. We're going to spend a lot of time with it and you'll get much better at it as we go forward. Are there any questions? No, at this point I'm going to go ahead and let you guys start working.